Hello everyone, welcome to our webinar entitled Specialty Diagnostics for Men's Health, Going Beyond the PSA. My name is Christine Stubbe and I am a medical education specialist at Genova's Asheville branch. I am going to serve as the moderator for today's webinar. Our speaker today is Dr. Warren Brown. Dr. Brown earned his doctorate degree from the School of Naturopathic Medicine at Bastyr University in Seattle, Washington. He then went on to complete an 18-month residency program in primary care naturopathic medicine at the Holistic Health Clinic in Tacoma, Washington. Dr. Brown currently practices in the suburbs of Atlanta, Georgia, where he provides an innovative and unique blend of functional and naturopathic approaches to patient care. In addition, Dr. Brown holds various teaching, speaking, and writing roles, experience which he brings to the medical education team at Genova Diagnostics. Dr. Brown enjoys working with practitioners from all medical disciplines while providing the support needed to help improve clinical outcomes for patients. So now I'm going to turn the presenter role over to Dr. Brown. Great. Excellent. Well, uh, thank you for the introduction, Dr. Subi. Uh, it's, it's great to be with you all uh, today speaking on a topic that's possibly more relevant now than it ever has been before. And as Dr. Subi mentioned, uh, I'm currently in private practice, so um, my, my thoughts and comments today will be uh, shared uh, with you from that perspective. Uh, and when I first had the opportunity to come up uh, or to present uh, on this topic, uh, I jumped right on it. And uh, over the next 45 minutes or so, um, I hope to show you why that is. Here's the overview of what we'll be discussing today. Uh, so we'll be looking at considerations for all men, uh, those that are on hormone therapy or not. Um, we'll be highlighting key pathways and patterns in androgen and estrogen metabolism, uh, specifically ones that are involved in disease risk. Uh, we'll provide an overview of, uh, of strategies um, that, uh, therapeutic strategies that can influence that hormone metabolism. And I'll also share with you uh, what some of the major organizations are saying about PSA testing um, uh, and as, as of uh, current. So, um, Please keep in mind that uh, we always need to be mindful of the big picture and acknowledge the patient, pre patient presentation. And um, that just means basically do your due diligence uh, and, and use your best clinical judgment with your patients. So that said, uh, let's start with some statistics on prostate cancer. Currently one in six men in the United States are at risk of developing prostate cancer. And aside from non-melanoma skin cancer, prostate cancer is the most common cancer among men in the United States. As of 2013, um, uh, roughly 176,000 uh, men were diagnosed with prostate cancer and uh, 27,000 uh, died from prostate cancer. Worldwide, that works out to about 13 million new cases of prostate cancer annually. So it's a big problem. When it comes to screening for prostate cancer, there are uh, two tools that have been around for a long, long time, and uh, they are prostate-specific antigen, PSA, and the digital rectal exam. And according to the CDC, PSA can be impacted by many different factors. And uh, when it comes to the diagnosis of prostate cancer, that can only be done via biopsy currently. There are some pros and cons for, for each of these tools. And for PSA, we know that some potential pros are things like reduction in prostate cancer mortality, um, a high specificity rate at certain values. Uh, there are some cons to think about. It uh, could be overdiagnosis and overtreatment, which has been uh, a big problem. Um, and that can lead to negative impacts in, of, uh, in quality of life. And we'll talk more about that a little later. Uh, the, the digital rectal exam, some, some pros uh, to that test are that it can, it can be helpful for detecting nodules on the prostate or enlargement from BPH. Uh, some cons are that it's uh, invasive, uncomfortable, 
Um, it's somewhat dependent on the efficiency and skill of the clinician and that 10% uh, of prostate cancers are undetected uh, by digital rectal exam. So these are imp imperfect tools, they're useful, uh, but they're imperfect tools and there is a need uh, to, to go beyond uh, these tools when we can. And, uh, and we'll, we'll spend more time talking about that later on. Here is uh, a study that was done in the uh, British Journal of Cancer. And uh, the study mentions that PSA screening for prostate cancer has long been controversial. Uh, although the PSA test is simple, safe, and has an acceptable sensitivity and specificity, estimates of the costs, risks of overdiagnosis, and side effects of the treatment are unfavorable. And when it comes to overdiagnosis, this might mean detecting cancers that pose little or no risk to the patient. Uh, and those, those would be sl very slow growing cancers. Uh, Overtreatment might mean uh, that uh, the, a needle biopsy gets done, uh, removal of the prostate, uh, radiation. Uh, some of these have significant impacts to quality of life. Um, a prostatectomy, for instance, uh, might have uh, potential side effects like sexual dysfunction or, or urinary function issues. So uh, decisions that um, aren't made lightly. Some recent developments uh, in the landscape of prostate cancer screening. Um, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll dive into that now, but before we do, I uh, just wanted to mention uh, the notion of watchful waiting and active surveillance. Uh, watchful waiting was essentially a, a, an avoidance strategy for the most part uh, that, was, um, that was more popular uh, several years ago. And that meant that treatments would be held off until absolutely necessary. And sometimes that involved androgen deprivation therapy. And active surveillance is, is a little bit more in vogue these days. Uh, that's more of a delay strategy, you know, delaying the therapy as long as it's safe, um, trying not to lose the window of opportunity for successful local therapy, if that applies, and uh, reserves treatments for intermediate to high risk cancers. Uh, as we see, though, most cancers are low-risk cancers. About 50% of them are identified as low-risk cancers. So uh, aggressive management um, just doesn't seem to make sense for, for uh, a low-risk cancer. And, a, and that's the way that some of the trends uh, in the area right now. Regarding screening and using the, the PSA, uh, the U.S. PFTF, uh, the U.S. Preventive Services Task Force, uh, recommended uh, up until uh, very recently recommended against uh, prostate cancer screening uh, using the, the PSA. And they, they cited the balance of evidence for both benefit and harms. Um, until very recently, um, they've, they've given it a grade D, which is not very good in terms of uh, evidence support. Uh, however, they do have a draft statement that's worth checking out, and that's on their website, and uh, they call it the USPFTF uh, Draft Recommendation Statement. And uh, here they seem to stratify screening by age and say that men for, for men ages 55 to 69, they give it a grade C, uh, which is a little bit better. And for men ages 70 or older, they give it a grade D. So there seems like they're in the process of, of reworking those um, uh, their position on the PSA. The American Urological Association also has an opinion about the PSA. Uh, they recommend against PSA screening in men under age 40 year old, under, under age 40. And uh, they, they don't recommend uh, routine screening in men between the ages of 40 to 54 who are at average risk. Uh, average risk is, uh, is most population who either doesn't have a family history of prostate cancer or is, is not uh, African-American. So uh, in other words, um, you know, they don't recommend, oh, they also don't recommend uh, PSA screening in men who are age 70 years or older with a less than 10 to 15 year life expectancy.
the National Cancer uh, Institute uh, via the NIH um, looks at a lot of different other organizations in order to make their recommendation for, for screening uh, based on PSA. And they say that uh, men who are at higher risk of prostate cancer, uh, meaning African-American or men uh, whose father or brother had prostate cancer, they should begin screening at age 40 to 45. Uh, they caution against routine population screening for PSA. And they say that patients should first be informed in detail about the potential harms and benefits of PSA screening. This is uh, the American Academy of Family Physicians. Uh, they seem to be going along with the US PFTF when it comes to uh, using the PSA for screening for prostate cancer. They give it a grade D uh, as of, as of uh, current. And the American Cancer Society, um, their position on PSA has been that the decision to test for it should be uh, a joint decision between uh, patient and provider and that it should uh, take into consideration the risks, the benefits, and the uncertainties of, uh, of using that method to detect uh, cancer. Uh, I like that they have uh, age stratified recommendations as well. And they say that, uh, for instance, uh, men age 50 who are at average risk of prostate cancer are expect and who are expected to live at least 10 years or more, uh, you know, would, would make a, a, a candidate. So there are some other clinical tools uh, to consider and this is really where the focus of, of this, this lecture will be. Um, there are some symptom questionnaires that can be very helpful. Uh, the International Prostate Symptom Score, or the IPSS, uh, as it's known, is uh, just a quick one-page uh, symptom questionnaire that you can hand to your patients, and, uh, and, and they can fill it out, and that can, it can give you a way to quantify symptoms and uh, can be really helpful for tracking um, prostate health. Uh, and it's it's can be used uh, for patients with uh, BPH, so uh, it's it's a it's a symptom questionnaire. So it can be uh, helpful to to check in with that. Um, there are some novel ways to use PSA uh, that I've outlined here. Uh, PSA density is a, basically a ratio of prostate or of PSA to prostate size. Uh, prostate size would have to be measured uh, via ultrasound first. The, the PSA velocity, which is PSA rate of change, how quickly that, that changes, uh, PSA doubling time, which is similar to velocity, and then there's free PSA, which is an estimation of the size of the prostate. Uh, PSA velocity and PSA doubling time, those are, uh, you might hear those referred to as PSA kinetics. Uh, just be aware that they're not always calculated the same by everyone. So. Uh, some organizations even go as, so far as to say that that uh, PSA kinetics aren't appropriate for for screening. They're more uh, appropriate for monitoring cancer. There are imaging techniques that can be helpful as well: endorectal MRI and color Doppler ultrasound. Uh, these have been uh, the technology around these continues to improve, so they can be uh, potentially useful tools. And then the focus of our talk today will be on the functional laboratory assessments that uh, can give us some additional information about the health of the prostate for men. Um, the sex hormone metabolite, metabolites, we'll talk about these in detail, the four hydroxy estrogens, which can potentially lead to the generation of, of quinones that can damage DNA. Uh, dihydrotestosterone, which is a potent androgen and a product of 5-alpha reductase activity. Androstenedione and testosterone, those can be aromatized into the estrogens. And then there are some genetic SNPs that, uh, that might be worth looking at as well, uh, cytochrome P450-1B1 and catechol O-methyltransferase, COMT. Before we get into those pathways, uh, just uh, just a couple of reminders here about our conceptually uh, speaking around testing for men. Uh, prostate cancer is generally silent until it reaches advanced uh, stages. So uh, symptoms can include urinary symptoms, uh, sexual dysfunction, 
Um, it can even include nodules on the prostate. Uh, so these findings could be ominous and therefore a conventional medical workup is advisable. Um, also be aware that, that BPH uh, can share some of these symptoms. So uh, that should also be on your radar if you're, if you're having a patient with a lot of urinary symptoms or sexual symptoms, um, it's worthwhile to check in on the prostate and uh, make sure that things are going okay there. Another reminder that uh, we, you know, we talked about BPH as having some similar symptoms. Uh, we, here we see that it shares some, some risk factors, uh, inflammation, metabolic factors, genetic factors, and uh, the focus of today's talk, uh, hormonal influences on prostate health. Um, hormonal influences can impact both BPH and prostate cancer, so uh, important to, to check those. This is another uh, conceptual slide here. So uh, I think of the steroid hormone pathways as, uh, as a waterfall. Sometimes I use this analogy when I'm talking to my patients where well, the sex hormones are made from a backbone of cholesterol. Uh, cholesterol can then uh, be converted into progesterone and DHEA. Uh, we can then convert that further downstream to testosterone, the estrogens, and the estrogen metabolites. And the estrogen metabolites are furthest downstream. Also, uh, speaking of streams, if we're looking at, uh, if we're looking for these sex hormone metabolites, we need to be looking in urine. Uh, that's, where they're, that's where we can see the most uh, metabolites. Uh, saliva is not appropriate for it. It's useful, but not for looking at uh, metabolites. And then we can see a couple of metabolites in serum as well, uh, but urine is really the place to go uh, when, you're, when you're looking for information on the sex hormone metabolites. Uh, if you're looking for the test to do it, uh, Genova's Complete Hormones is, uh, is a, gives you a, a lot of insight into the, the steroidogenic pathway and the metabolizing of these hormones. Um, you'll also see parent hormones on there. Uh, you'll see pathways like the, the cytochrome P451B1 pathway, which will be right here. We'll take a look at that in a moment. And then uh, you'll, you'll also get a few other things. You'll get uh, cortisol, the glucocorticoids, and their metabolites. Um, and then this test is also offered as a first morning void or a 24 hour collection. So um, you have options as to how you wanna run the test as well. Some more information on the complete hormones here, just for reference. I also need to mention that this test is not intended to be used as a screening tool for prostate cancer. Uh, however, some of the analytes have been associated with prostate cancer in the literature, and we'll talk more about those um, as we go through. Here's uh, the difference between the first morning void and the 24 hour for the complete hormones profile. Uh, the first morning void is a good choice for patients who aren't on hormone therapy. For patients who are on hormone therapy, who are taking hormone therapy, the 24 hour would be the test of choice because if they're taking, a, let's say a topical hormone, um, the, the rate at which that's absorbed into the body varies through the day. And so it's important to, to take an average over the course of the day. Uh, so the 24 hour would be the, the test to, of choice. These are my top five hormone pathways to know for men. Uh, so I tried to keep this very sh simple and straightforward and tried to simplify these pathways as much as possible because uh, it's, uh, that's the way I learn and that's, uh, that's the way I ex often explain them to, to patients. So um, we'll cover the 1B1 pathway, the 1A1 pathway along with the 3A4 pathway because I think those two, uh, it makes sense to focus on those functionally. Um, together. We'll take a look at the aromatase pathway, the 5-alpha reductase pathway, and the COMT pathway. And each of these slides coming up uh, in this next section will follow the pattern of, we'll describe the pathway, we'll show an example of the pathway, what you might see in the complete hormones, and then we'll also talk about some treatment considerations. Okay, for the 1B1 pathway, 
Uh, this is a pathway that uh, when I see uh, the complete hormones come back, uh, you know, this is one of the pathways that I always look at. And uh, this is one that involves the conversion of estrone into 4-hydroxyestrogens. And, uh, and that's, a, that's a point of importance because uh, those 4-hydroxyestrogens, as we'll see in a moment, they can, be, they can be converted through a few more steps to form catechol estrogen quinones. And uh, those quinones can go on to damage DNA and that can neoplastically transform uh, some cells. And uh, this is a study that looked at the catechol estrogens in, in prostate cells. It was in vitro. Uh, so uh, what we see here is that uh, in vitro exposure to the catechol estrogens could neoplastically transform human prosthetic epith epithelial cells, meaning they could take normal cells and turn them into cancerous cells. So 4-hydroxy uh, estrogens are more carcinogenic to prostate epithelial cells than the parent hormone E2. So it's a, it's a point of importance when we're thinking about prostate health. When we look at the complete hormones profile and we look at what we might see in results, uh, here's an example of excessive 4-hydroxy estrogen production. Here we see uh, estrone here at a, at a, I would say, low normal level here at 2.0, but yet we see its metabolite via the 1B1 pathway at high, frankly high. And uh, this is a high level of 4-hydroxy uh, estrogens, and, and that could, this could be a pattern where we're seeing excessive conversion from uh, estrone, and so that would be a cause of concern. Well, how do we deal with that? Well. The, the 1B1 pathway um, can be influ influenced. There are things that promote it uh, and there are things that inhibit it. And of the promoters, those would be things that you wanna avoid. So they would be things like environmental contaminants like hydrocarbons or PCBs. Uh, those can upregulate that 1B1 pathway. The uh, 1B1 pathway can be uh, downregulated or inhibited with things like bioflavonoids uh, and grapefruit. Also, however, uh, we, we, it's, it's, it's pertinent to think about supporting the 1A1 pathway because that's a more favorable way to metabolize estrogens. So we'll talk more about that 1A1 pathway in just a moment, but sometimes the therapeutic focus is to shift things from the 1B1 pathway towards the 1A1 pathway. Also, uh, I think this is a, it's a good place of any uh, to talk about the, um, the genomic add-ons that are available for the complete hormones profile. Uh, the 1B1 is a, uh, is, a, is a SNP that we can look at uh, for this uh, in the complete hormones. It can be added on so the, it can be done at the same time as the complete hormones profile. So really useful to have that information, that genotypic information of does this patient have a SNP in the 1B1, along with the phenotypic information that we get from looking at the complete hormones uh, and, and seeing the activity of the 1B1. Um, and the 1B1 is pertinent uh, because it does have uh, it does have associations with uh, breast, cervical, endometrial, uh, prostate, and uh, other types of cancers as well. Here's that proposed mechanism for the 1B1 pathway and the initiation of, of, um, of uh, dangerous metabolites. So here we have uh, estrone or estradiol converting down the 1B1 pathway to 4-hydroxyestrogens. Uh, then that can proceed down a series of pathways that forms quinones, uh, interacts with DNA, and can cause depurinating adducts. Um, ultimately, uh, worst case scenario, the, the cells become neoplastic. So the next pathway we're going to talk about is the 1A1 pathway and the 3-4A pathways. We'll talk about them together. And uh, those pathways involve the conversion of estrone to 2-hydroxyestrogens and 16-alpha. And so uh, the higher, there's some literature 
Uh, I will say it's it's limited, uh, in some cases mixed. That indicates a 216 ratio, uh, a higher 216 ratio is favorable. Um, but uh, yeah, I would encourage you to dive further into that if you want. Um, but we do know that uh, upregulating upregulating these pathways is generally favorable to the 1B1 pathway because of the potential danger of making the 4-hydroxy estrogens. So we'd rather make uh, 2-hydroxy estrogens rather than the 4-hydroxy estrogens, in other words. Here's an example of a, a normal pattern, uh, what we would like to see for uh, the the two hydroxy estrogens and the 16 alpha. Here's the 1A1 pathway here. Uh, normal uh, amount of estrone being converted to a normal amount of two hydroxy estrogens. Uh, same applies for the 3A4 pathway where we see lots of normals here. So this would be an ideal result. And we also don't see a lot of four hydroxy estrogens being produced as well. So that's a good finding. When we think about uh, therapeutic goals uh, in impacting these pathways, uh, the 1A1 and the 3-4A pathways, I, you know, some of my favorites are things like cruciferous vegetables, uh, getting the patient to eat more broccoli, cauliflower, Brussels sprouts, those types of things uh, can help uh, support that 1A1 pathway. Uh, avoiding things like sugar, uh, too many omega-6 fats, things like that can also be worth worthwhile. Um, that 1A1 pathway is, is where we see a lot of the work from DEM and I3C uh, uh, it doing, doing a lot of heavy lifting there. And other things like fresh ground flax, exercise, proper thyroid function, um, avoiding pesticides, lots of different ways we can support those pathways and support healthy uh, estrogen metabolism. The aromatase pathway. Uh, is one that converts uh, testosterone to estradiol, um, and it also converts androstenedione to estrone. And basically, you're converting androgens into estrogens. And the aromatase enzyme is found in lots of different tissue types. Uh, adipose tissue is, is maybe the one that, uh, that sticks out uh, to me the most as a clinician. Uh, for instance, if, if a, a patient, if you have an overweight male patient or an obese male patient and they have low testosterone and they're producing lots of estradiol and you give them testosterone, there is a chance that they could be converting that rapidly through all of that aromatase activity in making more estrogen. And that may not be what they need. So weight loss, it's one of the reasons why weight loss is, is, is one of the central strategies for me around uh, limiting that, uh, the activity of that aromatase. Here we see it in the complete hormones. Uh, I've taken a screenshot of it here. Uh, the, here are the aromatase pathways here. So they're, they're on the sides here. This is, an, this is also an example of excessive conversion because here we see the androgens, uh, the 17 ketosteroids total, are, they appear to be low. And uh, if you look on the second page of the complete hormones profile, you can see the 17 ketosteroids uh, summed up for you and plotted in a, in a reference range there. So they're low here, yet when we look at the estrogens, uh, E1 and E2, they're high normal, almost high. So this is a this is a case where uh, we're seeing a lot of conversion from from that aromatase enzyme. Here's some treatment considerations. Uh, some of my favorites are um, things that inhibit that aromatase enzyme, uh, things like flavonoids, a stinging nettle, uh, ideally the root, uh, not necessarily the leaf, uh, when it comes to nettle. Um, vitamin C, anastrozole can, can uh, inhibit that enzyme as well. And uh, you know, there are things that can promote it. And we talked about adipose tissue, uh, a, a potential promoter, alcohol, chronic inflammation. These types of things can promote that pathway. And most guys want to hold on to their testosterone as much as possible. Um, and in circumstances where you see the androgens low, uh, it makes sense to try and uh, take some action to maintain those um, uh, in most cases. 
Five alpha reductase uh, pathway is uh, is also one that's that's um, one of my top pathways, and this five alpha reductase enzyme uh, converts um, androstenedione to and androsterone and testosterone to dihydrotestosterone. So uh, it, it works, uh, the enzyme works kind of as an amplification mechanism for testosterone uh, because dihydrotestosterone is five times more potent than testosterone. It's also found in prostate tissues. Uh, dihydrotestosterone has associations with male pattern baldness, uh, also BPH. So it's one that uh, can also impact prostate health. And uh, when the pathways are upregulated, the 5-alpha reductase pathway is upregulated, more dihydrotestosterone is produced as a result. And that may not always be a good thing. The 5-alpha reductase pathways, uh, when we're looking at the complete hormones report, here we see uh, an example of excessive 5-alpha reductase activity. This is calculated from a ratio. So 5-alpha reductase activity, um, in order to, to get an assessment on that, we can calculate the etiocalanolone to the androsterone, um, and that will give us a ratio. And this is found on page two of the complete hormones profile. Uh, a, a, a low uh, number indicates more 5-alpha reductase activity. Um, and here we see the 5-alpha reductase pathway uh, there and there and we see the etiocalanolone and the androsterone. And so by looking at the, taking a ratio between the two and comparing the 5-alpha and 5-beta, you can get a sense of 5-alpha reductase activity. 5-alpha reductase pathways, uh, when it comes to treatment considerations, uh, I'm sure many of you have been to conferences where the whole slide is filled with 5-alpha reductase inhibitors. And, uh, and I think of 5-alpha reductase inhibitors a little bit differently. I think of true classic uh, inhibitors of the enzyme as being things like saw palmetto, uh, finasteride, uh, finasteride like Proscar, Propecia, and uh, dutasteride like Avidart. So those are classic inhibitors in my mind. But there are some other things that I think are, are more uh, appropriate to, to call uh, maybe complementary in therapy to a 5-alpha reductase inhibitor. Those would be things like nettle, EGCG, progesterone, zinc, uh, metformin, which can uh, be helpful in androgen receptor targeting, and uh, spironolactone as well. Um, of course, we can't forget about these. Uh, these are really important here. So if a patient has high insulin levels, or if a patient has type 2 diabetes, or if the patient is overweight, um, that really does need to be addressed uh, if, we if we really want to have a, a comprehensive approach to 5-alpha reductase activity and to the patient's health overall. Uh, if those things are out of control, uh, those need to be, um, there's work to do there. So um, very important. The COMT pathways, uh, well, these are, um, these involve conversion or conjugation more specifically of hydroxylated estrogens. And that converts the hydroxy groups to the methoxy groups. And this pathway can be compromised in a patient who has a COMT SNP. Uh, so uh, here we see the 2-hydroxy being converted to the 2-methoxy and the 4-hydroxy being converted to the 4-methoxy. Looking at the complete hormones report, uh, this is what we would see for an example of poor methylation. And I've got two examples of this. Uh, here we see the estrone level um, uh, converting into the 2-hydroxy estrogens looks pretty robust there. Uh, and then we see that the 2-hydroxy is being converted to the 2-methoxy. But, uh, they're, and they're both high, but note the reference range here. So if, if this patient's result is 24.5, which is twice the top of the normal range there, which is 12.5. Conversion through the COMT enzyme, and we get a level that's still high, but it's not as high. It's at 2.7, and the top of the range there is 2.5. Uh, we also see uh, at a glance uh, the 4-hydroxy estrogens and the 4-methoxy 
uh, estrogens. Here we're high, here we're below detectable limits. Keep in mind though that most of the methylation activity uh, happens at the twos, the conversion of the two hydroxy to the two methoxy. And on page two of the complete hormones report, you can see um, a sense of more methylation or less methylation um, uh, listed there for you. Here's a second example. Uh, and I put this one in because I think it's worth mentioning because here we see uh, a two hydroxy uh, that's, that's, not quite, that's not very high, it's actually low normal. Uh, but with conversion of the COMT enzyme, we see that it goes below detectable limits. Um, and so that creates a, a less than the less than sign uh, followed by DL, which is detectable limit. And that means it's below the level of detection of the instrument that, uh, that the lab uses. So uh, that greater than or less than sign, whatever it may be, gets carried over into the, into the activity ratio. So if you see something like this, less methylation uh, with a greater than or a less than sign there, uh, then just look back to here and you'll get, you'll, you'll get uh, you know, the full story. So just a note to, uh, uh, that you might see going forward. The COMT pathway, um, like the 1B1 pathway, we can look at the genetic SNP uh, right along with the, the complete hormones profile. So you get um, some genotypic information uh, if you order the SNP add-on for COMT. And uh, if the patient has a, a SNP uh, at um, here, a, a homozygous mutation, uh, that's going to put the patient at potential for decreased COMT activity at a level of three to four fold reduction. Um, so it can be helpful if you're wondering how well your patient's methylating and you're looking at the complete hormones. Here you can, uh, you can, you have the option to add on that SNP. For methylation support or COMT support, uh, I'm sure you all are probably familiar with these, magnesium, B vitamins, particularly 2, 6, and 12, uh, and folic acid uh, as MTHFR, uh, or as, as uh, 5-methyl tetrahydrofolate, rather. Uh, trimethylglycine, SAMe, and methionine, and uh, things like stress management can also be helpful. Here are some other uh, clinical considerations and resources related to uh, related to, to testing in this in this area of, of uh, men's health. Um, you have the option to add on MTHFR and VDR as well. So you have the option to add on four different um, genomic SNPs. Uh, I like to add on uh, MTHFR. Uh, I like that with COMT because then you get a sense of, uh, you get another uh, genomic marker that can give you a sense of a uh, patient's potential ability to met methylate. Um, then uh, vitamin D, uh, you can add VDR to this, uh, this, this profile as well. And uh, that can be particularly helpful for a uh, patient who, um, who might have a, a propensity towards osteopenia or osteoporosis. And you wanna know if there's any, um, anything standing in the way, so to speak, genetically that might prevent them from utilizing their vitamin D appropriately. I also want to mention this. Um, this is just the conceptual framework for looking at hormonal health. Um, and it begins with the adrenals and then works its way up to the thyroid and the sex hormones. And a lot of people do start at the sex hormones. And, I, and, and because these are so intricately connected, um, it, it often makes sense to check in on the adrenals first and make sure that they're functioning appropriately. Uh, look at thyroid function as well, uh, and then look at the sex hormones. Um, all of these can impact one another through complex physiological mechanisms. So uh, it's important that we not forget about thyroid and adrenals when we're thinking about hormonal health. The steroidogenic pathways uh, handout is, uh, this is a great tool for, uh, for clinicians and patients alike. Uh, it's, it's one of my favorite uh, resources on gdx.net. 
And it's really helpful because if you have a patient in front of you and you're going through uh, the hormone results, it's helpful to see it in pathway form. But when you're talking about the therapeutic aspects, sometimes it's helpful to be able to point to those as well. And for the informed patient, uh, they seem to appreciate uh, that extra level of detail in terms of explaining these. Um, also, if you see Genova at a conference, uh, you can often pick up a, a color copy of this uh, if you're looking for, uh, for a hard copy. So uh, it's a great, uh, great tool and it's, you can download it or, or, um, or look for Genova at a conference and they'll usually have this. I want to thank you again for taking time out of your day to, to join us. I also want to thank you, Dr. Stubbe, for facilitating today. And uh, that is all I have. So I will um, open it up for some questions. All right. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Dr. Brown. That was really a great presentation, really informative. Um, we have received some clinical questions. Uh, before we start with that, I do want to tell everyone that the PowerPoint today will be available on our website in PDF format next week. Um, so here's a couple clinical questions for you. The first one is, Will this complete hormone test be accurate for patients on androgel? Oh, good question. So androgel being a, a synthetic hormone uh, may create some unpredictable results in the parent hormones. However, uh, the metabolites would still uh, be accurate. So um, because it's a synthetic hormone, it's different than the, the body's uh, form of testosterone. So it's, it's not a bioidentical hormone, androgel isn't. So therefore, uh, you'd be looking at the estrogen metabolites, the parent hormones, they may be unpredictable. So uh, good question. And generally speaking, um, most of the most of the time when when uh, when I see these reports and I talk with uh, other clinicians about them, uh, the patient is on bioidentical uh, hormones, meaning that that molecule is identical to what the, the body makes. Good question. All right. And so the bioidenticals would be represented on the report then? Correct. Uh, they'd be fully represented. Uh, again, just as a reminder, the, we'd be looking at the 24-hour uh, complete hormones if we're looking for a patient who's on hormone therapy. And for somebody who's not on hormone therapy, the first morning void would be fine. Okay, great. Um, another question here. So on the report, it says less methylation or more methylation um, for that ratio. So the part that says less methylation, does that mean that the patient needs methylation or are they over methylating? What is, can you explain that a little bit better? Sure, good question. Uh, that is a statement about the patient's ability to methylate. In other words, uh, less methylation means the patient may need methylation support. Um, I would also say, while we're on the topic of methylation, um, this is one area in the body that we're looking at for methylation. So um, there are other ways we can look into methylation. If, For instance, if you're looking at a NutraVal or an ION, which is uh, Genova's nutritional assessments, um, if you look at those, you can get a sense of the patient's B vitamin needs for B12 or folic acid, and, and that can give you some insight as well. Um, but uh, but it's keep in mind, this is one uh, aspect of methylation, so it's not uh, the full story re regarding methylation. Okay, great. Um, another question here, are the genetic test add-ons a blood draw? No, the genetic, um, the, the genetic test add-ons uh, are done through a buccal swab. So it's just a swab of the cheek, and uh, that's, that's, it's a very simple collection, and that's how um, the, the genomic markers are uh, assessed. Okay, and that all comes in the same kit, is that right? So they have the urine collection and the buccal swab all in the same kit, or is it separate kits? Do you know? Uh, same, same, it should be same kit, last time I checked. Great, okay. Um, another question here about how do you use PSA in your practice and do you follow the levels? 
I like the uh, the guidelines from the NIH National Cancer Institute. Um, I do use PSA. It is a it's a valuable tool, but I always keep in mind that it's not the full story. Um, and so, uh, the the idea of explaining that to patients before ordering it is one that I also use in practice. So, uh, it's it's one that some guys can get. Uh, you know, they can get pretty worked up if they see their PSA high and then they go Google something and they see uh, all the potential um, negative effects of a high PSA. So um, I do uh, set some expectations ahead of time before I order it. And I do order it and I do find it a useful tool, but I find that uh, there's, I have a need for, for additional resources to tell me about prostate function just because of the imperfect nature of the PSA. Sure. Okay. Um, and does, does the test that you were describing, the complete hormones, measure DHT? I know you were talking about the 5-alpha reductase pathway. Good question. It, it doesn't measure dihydrotestosterone. Uh, so DHT is not measured in the complete hormones. Uh, how we get an assessment of the pathway, though, is, is through that, uh, through the ratio of 5-alpha to 5-beta, and that can give us a sense of um, if the, how active that 5-alpha uh, pathway is. Okay. Um, and DHT is a serum test, right? Yep, that can you can order that in serum. It's it's not cheap uh, for at least for for my patient uh, my patients, but the the labs that uh, um, you know it, it will it will vary from lab to lab, but it's available as a serum test from most big labs. Okay, um, and you mentioned the um, I guess effects of other. Um, glands on sex hormones. So you were talking about that pyramid, the adrenals and the thyroid. Um, how do you evaluate the adrenals? The adrenals, uh, my favorite way to do that is with a four-point uh, salivary cortisol test. Um, the, the Genova test is uh, the adrenal cortex stress profile. And that includes uh, four measurements of salivary cortisol through the day and it includes uh, a salivary uh, measurement of DH, uh, DHEA as well. Mm -hmm. So uh, you get that, that, uh, that uh, diurnal rhythm uh, in the test. Uh, it's, it's easy to do, um, it's simple, it's, it's not very expensive and uh, does provide you a lot of information about the, the cortisol rhythm. Okay, um, and then just looking at the complete hormones test, there are glucocorticoid metabolites on there as well. So you do get an assessment of, um, of you know, the cortisol metabolites on the urine test as well, right? Right, you do. You get, uh, you get, an, you get a sense of output, uh, cortisol output. And um, when looking at the, when we, when we look at it throughout the day though, at four different times, then we can get a sense of rhythm. And it can be valuable to look at both, both provide uh, information about adrenal function. Uh, but if you're looking for uh, the rhythm of cortisol through the day, um, I, I like saliva to do that. Okay. Um, and then ha do you have any recommendations for thyroid testing using Genova tests? Yeah, the we have uh, uh, Genova has a comprehensive thyroid assessment, um, and that'll provide a look at um, at all the popular thyroid markers, including antibodies. Um, so, and it also plots it in a in a pathway format, which is kind of nice. So that would be the comprehensive thyroid assessment. Okay, great. Um, Another question here, Do you, are you familiar, they're asking about the PCA3 test? PCA3 test, you know, I'm not familiar with that one. I hadn't used that. Um, I, when, I'm, when I'm looking at monitoring uh, using the PSA, I like, uh, I like the, the PSA velocity. Um, but again, it, it's a... Uh, it's not an all-inclusive marker. It's it's one that you have to 
keep in mind context of the patient. Um, and it's and it's also calculated in different ways. Um, I've also heard of one called the 4K score. I'm not too familiar with that one either. Um, but those are, you know, I think, I think when it comes to PSA, um, a lot of folks are still trying to figure out how how to use it and what exactly is best practices. And uh, th there's been a lot of movement um, in the last 10 years or so in terms of how we use PSA. And, uh, and there are some uh, innovative and other unique ways uh, to, to look at it as well. Um, and I've tried to outline just the most popular ones um, in this presentation, but it's not uh, all inclusive. Okay. Um, and then another question, do any of these tests show nutritional cofactors that the, the patient might be deficient in? So I know that you were talking about nutrients and things that might help with hormone metabolism. So it doesn't seem that the hormone test would show the specific nutrients, but maybe you can speak to that a little bit. Yeah, that's a good question as well. And um, that would be kind of nice to see nutrients added to the pathways, sort of like uh, what, what you find in the NutraVal. Um, but in terms of nutritional assessments, uh, really the most, the, the most comprehensive way you can do that is, is through something like a NutraVal or an ION. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's because you'll be looking at organic acids, amino acids, fatty acids, uh, nutrient toxic elements, even some oxidative stress markers. And if, when it comes to making uh, nutrient recommendations or correcting nutrient deficiencies, that really is uh, uh, just uh, provides a ton of information that, uh, that can be helpful for that. And it provides a more thorough assessment of nutritional status. So the the complete hormones, a uh, great test for looking at hormones and, and considering uh, some things like methylation that are nutrient related, but uh, to really get, you know, really put your finger on uh, nutrient deficiencies, um, look to, uh, my advice would be look to the ion or to, or to the NutraVal. Mm -hmm. All right, great. Well, um, in the interest of time, we will end our question and answer period there. Um, thank you, Dr. Brown, for answering those questions. Um, for additional educational materials, we'd like to encourage you to visit our website, www.gdx.net. After taking advantage of the materials found on our website, please feel free to contact client services with your questions. On the screen, you can see a number for U.S. and U.K. customer service. Additionally, please call client services if you need assistance in setting up a MyGDX account. We also offer complimentary appointments with our medical education specialist to answer questions related to our testing, which might include choosing the right test and also reviewing your patient's test results. And we'd like to encourage you to look for upcoming webinars on our website. Next month, we have Dr. Philomena Trindade speaking on estrogen metabolism. Are we assessing it properly? Thanks again, Dr. Brown, for a great presentation, and I want to thank everyone for joining us today. Thank you, Dr. Stubbe. Thanks, everyone, for your time. All right. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.